Captain. Thank you so much. Before we get started, can I get a sound check? I don't know about you guys, but I had difficulty hearing our moderator, and I want to make sure that you can hear me okay so that we don't lose out on any of the sound. If you would please just post in the chat whether or not you hear my voice okay and that there's no interruption in it. Okay, great. I'm glad to see that. I see it privately. We are going to talk about a lot today. We have the new joint employer guidance that just came out in January for, um, from the DOL. What I will be telling you about today is specifically that information. But I think it's important to understand that this is not new information nor a new initiative on the part of the Department of Labor. In fact, there's been quite a few regulatory agencies really interested in the issue of joint employment. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the specific guidance with regards to the 2016 um, administrator's interpretation. Whenever you see AI, that is administrator's interpretation, WHD stands for uh, Wage and Hour Division, so this would be a WHD AI 2016-1, which would be the first interpretation for the year of 2016. That is how they number them, and that is how you can find them on the Department of Labor website. We're going to talk about, like I said, we're going to talk a lot about the, this particular uh, information with regards to the interpretation and how that guidance um, is presented from a perspective of the Department of Labor and its enforcement activities with regards to the Fair Labor Standards Act. We're also going to go into some of the, uh, the, the, the guidance itself gives some fairly decent um, examples with regards to the horizontal and vertical employment analyses that they would be performing. But I also wanted to take that a little bit further and give you a little bit more of an understanding of what a weak, moderate, or strong indicator would be. So we're going to go through quite a bit of those. And then ultimately, the reason why you're here is how do you prevent uh, the issue of joint employment uh, from becoming a liability for your organization? So I will spend quite a bit of time on that and, and hopefully present you with an idea that would help you to work through some of your operational practices. Um, it's important, though, that you consider what the agenda is when we talk about the wage and hour division interpretation on joint employment. So I think one of the things that really gets into the heart of this is understanding that an administrative interpretation is not a binding law. Uh, it is nothing more than an interpretation. They use the Fair Labor Standards Act as well as the uh, MSPA to coordinate it with relevant judicial decisions in formulating their guidance in the interpretation. So this is very important to understand it is not binding law. However, that doesn't mean you can sit back and rest on your laurels, and I will explain, explain that as we go through this webinar. Um, this is likely, this determination is likely going to be challenged. Um, not specifically because of their distinction between vertical and horizontal, but for the use of the economic realities test, because that is not shared by a lot of judicial decisions. Um, one of the things I will tell you is that the distinction they use for vertical and horizontal analysis is noticeably absent from their own regulations on joint employment. So this is something they've wanted for a long time, have never been able to get it through, and is now through. We'll see how far it goes before it actually gets challenged in court because of one real particularly troubling area, and that's where they uh, attempt to link one employer to another employer as an employee, and we'll go through that. That's a puzzling linkage. It's not likely to be upheld in court, um, but as long as they have it to guidance, as their guidance, it will become their enforcement perspective, and until it's challenged in court, it will stand. Um, we'll, we'll get into that in just a, a few minutes. There isn't a hidden agenda here. Uh, they're pretty candid about what they're trying to do uh, with this administrator's interpretation. First and foremost, they want to expand the definition of what it means to be an employee 
Um, that's the statutory coverage of the FLSA. They want to expand it to small businesses and then be able to collect back wages from the larger pockets in a larger business. Um, it's pretty candid. They've been pretty open about it. They targeted specifically the industries where small businesses really seem to be uh, in concentration, construction, agricultural, janitorial, staffing, hospitality, go on down the list. But when you couple this with the misclassification priority that the Department of Labor has had now for the last five years, we're talking about misclassifying independent contractors that are in fact employees. And then look at the fact that the guidance spells out that they're looking at the relationship of owners, partners, and other members of a limited liability company, as well as subcontractors. And yes, all of this is in the guidance. And you start to realize that they're targeting these other industries with the idea of eventually expanding into all industries. So this really means that the the impetus here is going to come from the data they are able to collect from the smaller companies that conciliate so that when it is challenged in court, they will have a number of pieces of data to prove their position, and that in itself will provide impetus to expand the power um, of this agenda to scrutinize all employment of re uh, relationships across all industries. So it is an important piece of guidance. It is something that you do have to take um, seriously and then really consider some of the things that you are doing that could potentially put you at risk. One of the things that I wanted to bring up here is that expanding the concept of joint employer is not a new thing. First of all, the, the whole idea of joint employment dates back to the enactment of the FLSA in 1938. Um, it's, it's in the language of the law, and you can see that when you read that, that piece of legislation. The wage and hour interpretations of joint employment go back to at least 1958. Um, that is as far back as I actually researched. I didn't really feel the need to go any further. All I'm trying to say here is this is something that the Department of Labor has found of particular interest, not just the current uh, head of the department, but many, almost all of the previous uh, uh, political appointees to the department. So uh, joint employment is a big deal to them, and it's gotten more of a con become more of a concern because of the changing workforce and how we as employers tend to uh, define employee uh, with an effort of um, minimizing our own risk when it comes to managing employees. This particular guidance is a continuation of the only guidance that they actually issued in 2015. So if you look at 2015-1, uh, AI number 2015-1, you'll see that they, they issued a, a set of guidance with regards to misclassified independent contractors and really expanded on the uh, concept of suffer or permit standard uh, in there. We'll go through that in a little bit. So, Really, this has been a very active um, agenda for the Department of Labor now, in specific the White House, uh, I mean the Wage and Hour Division, uh, since uh, 2014, but really the two pieces of guidance that are relevant here are the 15 and 16 pieces. In 2015, the NLRB really started this off when they, uh, with their desire to unionize small businesses, it, particularly franchisees, uh, they issued a set of guidance on joint employer. Uh, OSHA joined in fairly quickly after that with um, an understanding that everybody that is an employer in a multi-employer work site should be responsible for the workplace safety of all the employees on the site. So they too jumped on the wagon for joint employer. And finally, Wage and Hour issued their misclassification because that is a huge initiative. Um, the IRS and Department of Labor are very interested in how we routinely call people independent contractors when in fact they don't pass the test for that designation. Um, huge issues when you do that. So what, I'm, what you see here is a, a very steady and ongoing uh, effort on the part of the regulatory agencies to define and further clarify the idea of joint employment. Uh, so this is not new. It is not something 